Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for checking out American Made. Today, we have a special guest who's going to share a very interesting story, a story about his father, who was an FBI agent for 26 years. Uh, he investigated some of the biggest mob bosses in the country. Uh, my guest today is Gary Clemente. Gary, how are you doing? Thanks for uh, coming here on the channel. Thank you for having me, Jesse. You've got a great program. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I reviewed some of the information that you've sent me about your father, and uh, he's got a really illustrious career that I think is worth sharing here on this channel, and and uh, I think the people will find it very interesting. Well, uh, I think so, too. Uh, as I was, uh, as I tell everybody, my mission statement isn't so much about me. It's really about my father's legacy, how important it was, and how historic uh, some of the things that he was involved with uh, in, 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 in investigating organized crime uh, throughout his career. Uh, as you know, the mafia, La Cosa Nostra, all of that is a very, uh, it's, it's a part of the American fabric. And my right. father was very, very much involved with that in the ground floor of investigating uh, the, uh, the, the mob, the mafia, and all of the uh, very, very dangerous people that were out to uh, not only make a profit, but really, uh, really soil the fabric of American life in this country. So that's that's why I'm here. Well, that sounds good. And uh, we'll definitely get into your father's story. But uh, to back up just a little bit, uh, I want to know a little bit, a little bit more about you. Well, uh, who, me and I, well, gosh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's harder talking about me than my father, but uh, um, I have a media background. I've, uh, I'm a longtime writer. I've been involved as a journalist. Um, I'm an author. Um, I, I've written many different things in media. I'm still involved with the media. Uh, I'm also a speaker. And uh, that's, that's, that's been my world over the years. Uh, uh, since college, I graduated from the University of Florida in 1974 with a, a degree in broadcasting. And um, I went on to do many different things so over the course of my years. I was, I've was i been a longtime journalist and uh, a writer, novelist, uh, I've written a children's book, uh, many different things. So writing has always been my milieu, as a matter of fact. And uh, I think I got it from my father because my father was an amazing writer. I'm going to show you something right now. Okay. This happens to be one fifth, one fifth of the writings of my father's career in organized crime that he left behind for me. So <laughs> he was pretty prolific in that regard. So I think I got a lot of the, uh, the writing genes from him. Yeah. Now, now your father, now I don't, I haven't, I haven't mentioned his name. His name is Peter Clemente. Um, where was he born and, and raised? Well, my dad uh, and my mom were both born in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, my dad was born uh, October 17th, 1922. And he passed away uh, almost six years ago, uh, just short of his 95th birthday. Oh, wow. And up until that point of his passing, he was an extremely, extremely well-read guy, always reading this guy, constant, you know, thick books, books about history, book about um, oh, uh, everything you can imagine. Uh, my father was a great reader. And up until his, uh, his passing, he was, he was an extremely sharp individual. And uh, uh, just before he he died. Uh, he was always talking about organized crime. The FBI was a part of his blood, and uh, there were so many, so many different stories that he that he passed on to me verbally, and not just uh, through the written word. Uh, so, uh, my, my dad was uh, just an amazing individual. He had an amazing life. He was a World War II guy. He was a World War II vet. Uh, he served in the Philippines. Uh, he was a uh, surgical tech. In the Philippines, delivered babies, uh, you name it, he did it. Um, came back from the war, uh, got his law degree from St. John's, and uh, started a law practice in New York. And um, it was a criminal law practice. 
and uh, eventually he eventually he joined the bureau and there was a uh, s- sort of an interesting story about how he how he joined the bureau um, he had a cousin of his that told him that well my my dad had always expressed an interest in becoming an FBI agent since he was a young boy since was well, since he was a young man he watched uh, the movie with Jimmy Cadney called G-Man, and he was so enthralled by that. My dad, even at one time, had thought about becoming an actor. <laughs> and uh, later on, I can tell you about how his, his acting chops, so to speak, uh, played uh, uh, to a certain degree his, uh, in his investigative prowess as a special agent in the FBI. But uh, uh, he, he joined the Bureau and uh, he had an illustrious career. It's a, it's a really interesting story about how he joined. Uh, so that's really the, uh, the, the short version of, uh, of my dad and his life. Now, your father, he, he mentions uh, the high esteem of the FBI during those days. For maybe younger people that are watching now, you know, they hear the FBI in the news all the time and a lot of negative opinions. But back in th- those days, the F- can you explain a little bit of the perception of the FBI to the public and, and J. Edgar Hoover? Oh, gosh. You know, uh, my dad, as as I mentioned, the movie G-Man with Jimmy Cagney, uh, the FBI as, de- as developed by J. Edgar Hoover, that was his baby. He That was his baby. He developed the bureau into what he wanted it to become. He molded that that organization, and he made it a very, very. He made it an organization with, with fidelity, bravery, and integrity. That's what the FBI stands for, not just the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Right. Uh, 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 but the FBI at that time was an extremely revered and esteemed organization. If you were a special agent in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, you were a top law enforcement officer. You were the creme de la creme, the, the cream of the crop. And uh, today's FBI, I, I think very sadly, pales. It pales in comparison. And I don't want to get into the politics of it, but there's right. a lot of politics involved. Yeah, But it pales in comparison to what the Bureau used to be. Yeah, I just wanted to to make that distinction and have you explain that because you know the perception of the the bureau in those days versus today and and how different that is. Um, you mentioned a, a interesting story of your father being hired and and a story that went along with that. Could you, could you get into that a little bit? Well, my dad uh, was always interested in joining the bureau, and he had made it known to his family. And one day. Uh, one of his cousins had come up to him and says, you know, Pete, they call him Pete. He says, Pete, I hear that you want to join the FBI. He says, my dad says, I certainly do. I really would. And his cousin said, well, don't bother. They don't take Italians. Well, my dad, who was my father? My father happens to be Sicilian, Italian and Sicilian. Both of my grandparents, his parents, were born and raised in Sicily. He was of Sicilian descent. And my dad told my cousin, he said, you've got to be kidding me. Well, <laughs> that was the, uh, the, the chip on my dad's shoulder that he, would, that he was about to knock off because, well, he said, well, I'll show them. He went down to the bureau, filled out the application. I, think I sent you. I sent you my dad's original application from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I wish I had it right in front of me right now. I'll show it to you. We'll put it in but the video. He, we'll yes, add it in. Uh, there you go. There you, you see the original handwriting, everything. So uh, he, he, he joined the Bureau. Uh, before that happened, when he applied, he had to go in for an interview. And he sat across from, a, uh, from another agent. And uh, they had a talk, and uh, my, the agent asked him, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clemente, why are you here? What, what, what spurred you to be? He said, well, I, I always wanted to be in the Bureau, but this nagging problem hit me. He says, I heard through somebody that the FBI doesn't hire Italians. 
And I said to myself, well, I'm going to show them. I'm going to come down here and show them <laughs> that I am, that I think that I'm the best of the best and that the Bureau deserves somebody like me. So my dad is looking at the agent and he looks down at the nameplate in front of him. And this gentleman happened to be in Italia. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So my dad uh, naturally said, well, I see your Italian. I think we have something in common, don't we? And the other agent laughed and uh, he said, yes, I think we have a lot in common. And I think you, just, you can dispel the notion that we don't hire Italians in the FBI. <laughs> yeah, I think that that says a lot about who your father was, that he he was it only determined him to pursue that career it didn't deter him at all. It only, you know, made him more determined and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but uh, his heritage, him, him being from Sicilian descent would later help him down the line. So I, I think that's pretty interesting. Exactly. That's one big reason why he was hired. And at that time, uh, I can show you a roster of uh, agents that were newly hired at that time. And I think maybe I, maybe out of that roster of, uh, it could have been 60 or so names that I saw handwritten by him. It might have been his name and maybe one other Italian agent that was hired at that time because Hoover was the sort of individual that wanted his, his FBI to have a certain look about it, okay? Now, whether you... Uh, be, whether you want to say that was that he was being prejudiced, well, I don't think that really was the case. Uh, he had a lot of Anglo's that he wanted within the within the bureau at that time. There were no African American agents at, at that time. Later on, there were. Later on, there were many more Italian agents, many many more uh, Puerto Ricans, and women later on in the bureau that that were hired. But at that time, Hoover wanted to have the, the Bureau uh, a, 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 appear to have a certain look about it. That was his purview, and that's what, that's what he followed at, at the time. Right. Now, after he was hired, where was he, where did, where was he located? Where was he working out of, and, and what were some of his early assignments? Well, in 1950, my father was first brought into the Bureau. That's when he was hired in 1950. And he started off at a small field office in Quincy, Illinois. And um, later on, I happened to be born in Springfield, Illinois. And I think within a year's time, uh, my father, after his exploits in uh, Quincy, he was transferred to the Cleveland office. Uh, he was there for about two or three years before he eventually was uh, uh, transferred to New York. And I do believe he put in for that transfer. He requested uh, to go to New York. So that's where he was eventually sent to. And, uh, and then just jumping forward a little bit, after New York for a number of years, he was transferred down to Miami. So that's more or less the uh, uh, le the logistics of his travels in the FBI. Now, you mentioned you being born in Illinois. I saw some uh, letters that you sent me over where uh, every time your father and mother had a child or a big event in the family, uh, they would get a personal letter from J. Edgar Hoover. I thought that was really interesting. I'll have to, if you're okay with it, I'll have to add some of those in this video. That's oh, really sure, interesting. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Hey, there were six of us, Jesse, in the family. J. Edgar Hoover sent letters to my mom and dad every time there was the new addition to the to the family. And yeah, I read those. They everybody. were really he, cool. He did that with all the agents. That's the sort of uh, that's the sort of organization that uh, Hoover had developed. Yes, we can get all of the contentiousness that developed with Jade Hoover and how he ran the Bureau, uh, the, the love-hate relationship that he had with his agents, uh, the love-hate relationship that he had with uh, many of the politicians and people in government that, uh, that, he, uh, that he developed over the years. So that's, uh, that's, those are, are entirely different issues. 
You mentioned uh, he was transferred to New York. This was during the the early 50s. Is that right? That's right. Uh, he was probably transferred to uh, New York, uh, I'm guessing, around uh, 1954, maybe 1953, uh, right, right in that right in that era. Right in that, that right in that time slot, and um, his first uh, detail that he was involved with was uh, doing security background checks for people that were applying for very sensitive government positions in the U.S. government at that time, and uh, they did background checks on these people. Why to see? if perchance they were members of the Communist Party USA or the Socialist Workers Party. Uh, these were very, very subversive groups that were looking to undermine, undermine the fabric of, uh, of American life, not just within government, but American life in general. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip to a short story here, you know, shortly before my dad's passing, I asked him, I said, hey dad, those people that you used to do security background check to see whether they were members of the Communist Party USA, Dad, aren't those people now entrenched and buried within all reaches of our government, all of our bureaucracies, uh, Congress, the Supreme Court, even the White House? I said, do you agree, Dad? He, he said, absolutely. So that really shows you how far this country has come from that point in time in the early 1950s to 2023. Right. Yeah. And, and just for context to maybe some viewers uh, that may not know, or that may be a little bit younger uh, during this time, during the early fifties uh, I mean, there were like Senate hearings and, and there was a lot going on and, in, and in involving, communist infiltration a lot of investigations so that was a really big a big thing that's you know this was before the bureau really started focusing on organized crime it was it was more focused on uh investigating the communist party here in america is that right exactly exactly uh hoover the one thing that hoover hated the most more than anything jesse was communism that was his number one fear, his number one hatred. Yeah, I've read that before. Yeah. And uh, he was uh, very vig vigilant about protecting uh, American life and the, the fabric of American society from the uh, clutches of communism. Uh, he wrote a book. It was called Masters of Deceit. Uh, I read the book many, many, many years ago. It's, it's a great great expose on how uh, Marxist communists think and what their, uh, what their plan was to take over uh, the United States. And uh, I dare say that they are still working on that. And to a great degree, I believe they've, they have succeeded. Uh, what the final battle will be, it's still being played out. We'll, right. we'll see what happens. Yeah. But uh, Eugene McCarthy at that time was um, conducting hearings on uh, uh, communist uh, influences, not just in government. Uh, a lot of it was, uh, you know, the State Department. Uh, there were accusations of communists in the, within the CIA at the time, back, even back then. Uh, there was certainly an influence of communism even back then within Hollywood. Uh, Dalton Trumbo, uh, who wrote uh, the famous movie Spartacus, uh, a, a, and a, uh, a great screenwriter at that time, was indeed a, a communist. Uh, there were many, many people in Hollywood that really were card-carrying communists. And it yeah. really was a threat. So it wasn't just a matter of McCarthy uh, trying to conduct a witch hunt and, um, and and smear people. There was a lot more to it than that. Yeah, and and New York was a very a very important place uh, where your father. Um, there was a lot to 
to do. And uh, your father mentions in his notes, some of the notes that I read that that you sent that uh, because of the UN being located there in New York, and also it was the Communist Party headquarters located in New York. So, so there was a lot going on. I think he wrote that uh, New York at that time was a hotbed of of Soviet spies during that time. Of course, it certainly was. People did not know that the Communist Party USA was bankrolled by the Soviet Union all the way up until their demise. They were funneling money into the Communist Party USA, the Soviets were. So uh, there was a uh, there was a big to do about that as well. Uh, I, I did want to say that uh, my my father's involvement with doing security background checks and the Communist Party USA and the Socialist Workers Party. He was the first one ever. This was historic. It was really really fascinating. Uh, at at that time, they the bureau wanted to get. Uh, People undercover within those organizations to find out what they were what they were doing, what they were up to, but they found it difficult. Uh, they they could have been they could have been easily made, so they really didn't pursue that avenue as much. So what my father did was he thought outside the box, and he developed five or six, I believe, uh, clean informants. People had no connection at all with the Communist Party, USA, the Socialist Workers Party. And he managed to insert them within these organizations to uh, get information from them. Uh, there's an interesting story about how my dad uh, developed one of those informants. Uh, he was a pretty cagey guy, my dad. So the way that he did it was, uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was it was pretty interesting. So he, uh, uh, he had five or six, of, and he was he was commended by Hoover personally through through letters and given uh, uh, bonuses and um, and, uh, and and an upscaling of his uh, government service level at that time too. So he did that as well. How did your father approach this person and and get him to uh, become an informant? Well, uh, the, the person I'm talking about uh, was happened to be the son uh, of a house painter. And the house painter, uh, the, the father, was very much involved with the Communist Party USA. He was a card-carrying member of it. Um, the son knew about it. And what happened, Jesse, was the father passed away. And my, and my dad waited until such time that he would approach the son, knock down his door, son opened it up, and my dad introduced himself. I'm Peter Clementi, I happen to be with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I would like to talk to you a little bit about your dad. So he invited him inside, you know, the son did, they sat down, they talked, and uh, uh, my dad told uh, the son, he says, uh, you, you, your father uh, was involved with, with the Communist Party USA, and he, uh, there was a lot of information that we got from him. And the son was a little taken aback. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, so you, you, your dad was supplying us information about, about what the communists were, were involved with. He's, and the son said, well, I, I didn't know that at all. And my dad says, oh, my gosh, it's that's the kind of guy he was. He, I guess he just didn't mention it to you. And uh, it turned out that, uh, well, my dad was fibbing. Okay, let's, let's get it out there. He was fibbing. He wanted to get into um, uh, the, the son's good graces. And uh, eventually what happened was uh, they, they got to be friendly and he developed him as an informant. Uh, somebody to go within the, uh, the party and extract information uh, happily, and uh, so he did. He did that for quite a while, as well as the five or six, uh, five or six other uh, clean informants that my dad developed too within the Communist Party USA. So uh, that, that, that to me that was fascinating. Yeah, that is fascinating. 
Hey what's up guys, I wanted to take a second to remind you, please hit that subscribe button and if you like what we're doing and want to make a donation, you can do that via Cash App at American Made Channel. Now, let's get back to the video. Now, uh, how, how long did he do uh, that particular uh, security detail? How long, how long did he do that? Well, he did that from about... <clears throat> From about 1953, 1954, uh, up until 1957, okay? And it wasn't until 1957 when a very, very uh, big event happened. And yeah, happened I wanted to, to ask you the, about that, yeah. Yes, it happened to be the, the, uh, the big mob enclave that happened in Appalachian, New York. And all of the biggest mobsters you can think of in the mafia, La Cosa Nostra, decided to meet at the estate of another, another mobster, who happened to be Joseph Barbera, who was a Canada Dry bottler, a bottling distributor up there. And this is upstate New York, it's sort of a, a, a smallish town. And um, what happened was, uh, the people in town got very suspicious because they saw these, they saw these guys with these shark skin suits, pointy Italian shoes, uh, wide fedoras, buying very expensive cigars and wine, cheeses, and these people were not probably a lot of meat. That's right. <laughs> they, they didn't look like they grew up in Appalachian, New York. Right. You know, they didn't yeah. look like homeboys, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So the information that got spilled to the New York State Troopers, and one of them in particular was uh, his name is Sergeant Cosgrove. And Sergeant Cosgrove um, set up a roadblock while all of these mob bosses were having their big meeting in Joe Barbera's house. And some of the Benton men were looking outside the window and they saw this roadblock on the other side of this large field that Barbera had where the fences were. And they said, oh my gosh, hey, 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 Tony, Joe, Tony, Tony, Bobby, Petey, you, they're setting up a roadblock over there. And everybody well, freaked out. Here are these mobsters, some of the biggest mobsters in the, in the world the Genovese's of the world, the Carlo Gambino's of the world, the Joe Pafacci's of the world. Next thing you knew it, they're running across the field, stepping over cow pies with their expensive <laughs> Italian shoes, trying to get away from the police. And they've got, their, they've got their wallets and they're throwing their wallets out of their coats and their pockets, you know. And the, uh, the uh, state troopers accosted them at the roadblock. Gathered, gathered them all up and found their IDs too in, in the field, gathered them up. And that's really, really more or less the, the, the story of how my, my dad got involved with organized crime because, because of that mafia enclave meeting. That's how my dad was interested in becoming a part of organized crime investigation. Yeah, that, that event really changed the direction of your father's career and also the FBI. They they uh, formed an elite squad. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, my dad had heard about the, uh, the, the mob enclave. The entire FBI knew about it. And uh, because my dad was in New York at the time, he wanted to get transferred to something that was being newly formed by Hoover. It was called the Top Hoodlum Program. And my dad particularly wanted to become involved and be a part of, of the Top Hoodlum Squad within New York. Um, he made the powers that be known. And, you know, he wanted them to know about it. Uh, they did have him come in. Uh, they immediately made him a part of it because a big, a, a big reason, Jesse, was because he was Sicilian. He could speak Sicilian. He grew up around it as, as, as a little boy. And uh, that's, that's, 
that's a big reason why they had him within the top of the squad. It was a very, very elite group of men that Hoover was uh, putting together to investigate the mob. And this was really, really was really fascinating, Jesse. Is because this is really after Hoover had uh, had declared uh, public, practically publicly. I think it was within the, the newspapers. I'm not sure, but he made a statement. He said that, that there's no such thing as organized crime. There's no such thing as the mafia. And everybody, right. I'm talking about everybody within government. All the way down to the uh, you know the brick cops that worked in the street knew that there was organized crime. How could how could there be? Uh, everybody knew who Lucky Luciano was. Right. They knew who these uh, they knew who these mobsters were. How can you say that there's no organized crime? There's a there are a lot of reasons that he said that uh, that I, uh, I can talk about much later. But uh, that's the fascinating part about all of it. He started the. He started the top hoodlum squad after he had mentioned that, knowing that uh, uh, there might have been blowback for it. But nonetheless, he pushed ahead full speed and uh, made it his mission to investigate uh, the mafia, La Cosa Nostra, uh, the honored society, as many of them uh, called it. And uh, it was full steam ahead. Yeah, I think the meeting at Appalachian sort of embarrassed J. Edgar Hoover because of those statements that that he had made about the mafia not existing. Uh, before Appalachian, what was the the bureau's uh, what 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 work did they do uh, to investigate organized crime? Because it was there, you know, b- before Appalachian, it was it was there in New York and a lot of the Midwest. Um, did they have any type of programs or any type of uh, investigative units that would look at organized crime, or they just it was ma- mainly focused on communism and other things. Yes, uh, prior to the Top Hoodlum Squad, Jesse. Yes, they did investigate organized crime, but not within the, not with the same fervor and uh, desire and passion that th- that they later did. Uh, I think a lot of it was because later on, you know, they, they more or less had to, the spotlight was on them. But before then, yes, they did inv- they did investigate organized crime. They knew who these mobsters were, but they did not want to get uh, stuck in the mire of it too much because they saw what, would, they saw what was happening with um, uh, the whole uh, business of um, uncovering communism uh, within within government, within the, the State Department, within Hollywood. It, it was a big, big stink about it. Uh, Hoover did not want to get uh, st- stuck in the muck of, uh, of, of uh, investigating the mafia because he knew that these men on the top level had a lot of buffers underneath him that would cover for them that would do their killing for them, that would uh, stash the money for them. So it was extremely difficult to to, uh, to put your finger on these people and arrest them and prosecute them and make it stick and get them in jail. So that's a big reason why Hoover might have said that, uh, well, we don't know if there really is an ex- the existence of, of, of the mafia. Uh, that's a big part of it, Jesse. Uh, now, during your father's time on the top hoodlum squad, uh, he did some investigative work uh, involving Carlo Gambino and Meyer Lansky. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, my dad was the first one ever when he got into the top hoodlum squad. One squad was the first. One of the first things he did was write uh, investigative. Was write. Uh, summaries, government official FBI government summaries that had not been read, you know, written before uh, about who Carlo Gambino was, who Meyer Lansky was, and uh, he was very, very much involved with that. Wrote up those, the, wrote up those summaries, and um, uh, uh, while he was in the Top Hoodlum Squad, he was the first one ever 
to do a face-to-face on the street interview with Carlo Gambino. Wow. Well, who is Carlo Gambino? Carlo Gambino happened to be the most powerful mob boss in New York at that time. He was the capo di tutti capi in Italian, which means the boss of bosses. Right. And uh, my father had it in his uh, mind uh, as an idea. He wanted to approach uh, Gambino to talk with him. And I'll, I will tell you why, what, we, what his motive was. But one day he waited for, for Gambino to leave his home. He knew where he, where he lived. It was a brownstone in New York. And uh, he waited for Gambino to get to his door. My dad's waiting in his car. And he sees Gambino up at the door. He gave his wife, uh, Kate, a kiss. Goodbye. Who was Kate Gambino? Kate Gambino happened to be Carlo Gambino's first cousin. He married his first cousin. And uh, uh, she was, uh, her name was Kate Castellano. She was the, she was related to Paul Castellano, who later on became the head of the Gambino family, and who later right. on was uh, killed. Uh, so uh, my dad waited for him to come out, and he was by himself. By himself? You say, How could he be by himself? He's got to have bodyguards, right? No, he had no bodyguards. He was that powerful. He didn't have to worry about it. The, the neighborhood knew who he was. They, they uh, Evidently, they, they, they loved him. They would have protected him, probably. And uh, so he approached my father as he came up the sidewalk and my dad got out of his car and accosted him face to face and said, excuse me, Mr. Gambino, my name is Peter Clementi. My, now my dad was speaking to him in, uh, in Sicilian, much of it, with, with some English. And um, he said, my I'm Peter Clementi. I happen to be with the FBI, and I'd like to ask you a few questions, if, if that's possible. And Gambino said, excuse me, you say you're who? I'm with the FBI. He says, you're with the FBI. He says, your name is Clementi? You're Sicilian. I, I hear you talk Sicilian. So you, you're one of us. Says, why, are you, why are you bothering? Why are you, why are you bothering me? He says, well, because uh, there's some very important things that I that you know about. And uh, so he interrupted him. He said something to him, uh, you know, profane. And he says, yeah, I've got nothing. I've got nothing to tell you. I'm an honest man. I have nothing to tell you. And I don't know why you're bothering me. You should be ashamed of yourself. My father said, I should be ashamed of myself. You should be ashamed of yourself. All of us within the Italian community are ashamed of you for what you've done to our people, the bad name that you've given our people. Well, mm. Gambino didn't like that. He says something in Italian, which means a few va fa cool, turned his back and walked away, left my father there. And uh, why did my father do that? Was he looking to get insulted by him? No. The purpose of my father's visit with him was one thing and one thing only was to hear Gambino's voice so that right. if in the future yeah. ever they wiretapped Gambino and they had his voice on tape, my father could listen to it and identify and that this yeah. is Carlo Gambino talking about these certain crimes, talking about his nefarious activities. That's why he did the face-to-face -face interview. Yeah, that that's pretty smart. Uh, I, I'm sure Gambino he he wasn't he wasn't used to being talked to that way. I'm sure that caught him off guard. No, no, not not at all. You did not approach uh, Gambino unless you were a made guy, right? If you even if you're an associate on the street, uh, you, you couldn't you couldn't approach him. He was he was that powerful. Uh, and then later on. There was another meeting between my father and Carlo Gambino, which is another story. So, so what happened was uh, they were listening, recording it on the reel-to-reel -reel tape. They had 
headphones on, the the, uh, the mob guys come in along with Gambino, and the two associates were angry. They was they were just really really upset. They said, "Doc, f this and f that." They wanted to have my father go in to Monmouth in in the in the jail in Monmouth and talk face to face with with Valachi. Well, they said, "Well, we want this Sicilian agent Peter Clementi to talk to you." Well, Valachi, uh uh-uh. uh bad idea, broken English and everything. I don't like that idea at all. How do I know that your FBI boy isn't involved with Vito? No, no Sicilians. Ah, 